Chair Powell, you can go ahead and start. We are live. All right, thank you. I call to order uh, the February 2021 meeting of the Board of Regents and uh, a good morning to, uh, to one and all. And uh, thank you to uh, welcome to my colleagues and thank you to all of you who are joining us uh, via the live stream video. Uh, before um, uh, I jump into the agenda, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge, uh, and especially for all of those uh, viewing, that um, Regents Anderson, Beeson, and Simonson, uh, uh, the three of them, uh, are not running for re-election. So I want to take the time now uh, to thank all of them for their extraordinarily deep uh, commitment to our university uh, and the yeoman's work that all of them have done uh, on this board, uh, and in some cases for, for many, many years. And I also just want to say, I think it's, we've not seen each other face to face uh, as a board for uh, nearly a year. And I know we all, you know, so we just so regret that. And, and I sure look forward to joining with the rest of the board uh, later in the year. I'm hoping maybe this summer when we can uh, meet uh, these three regions and see them face to face and thank them in, in person. But in the meantime, the, you know, the virtual thanks uh, will have to do. So um, with that, let me jump into uh, the agenda. Uh, the first item of business uh, this morning is approval of the minutes from our December and January meeting. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Can second. I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion or comments on the minutes, uh, please use, uh, as, as ever, raise hands or alert OBR staff if you want to speak. Any, any discussion? I don't, see, uh, I don't see any hands raised. Um, Mr. Steves, do you see anybody? I do not, Mr. Chair. All right. With no questions or comments, uh, Mr. Steves will call the roll on the minutes. On approval of the minutes, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson? Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport? Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her? Yes. Regent, Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron? Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum? Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, the minutes are approved, thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from, uh, we'll hear the report of uh, our president, uh, President Gable. Uh, good morning and over to you. Thank you, Chair Powell, uh, Vice Chair Swigum, members of the board, good morning. Um, I'd like to start by recognizing the life and, life and loss of our former CFO and treasurer, Richard Fitz, Fitz and Reuter, who passed away late last month. Um, Fitz served for nearly a quarter of a century at the U, 24 years, crossing four different presidencies with a tremendous legacy. We are huge beneficiaries of his expertise and service, and I know everyone um, joins me in in noting how fortunate we were to share his orbit and how much he will be missed. Um, members of the board, a lot has transpired since our last formal meeting in December. We finished the fall semester and are now off and running into the spring. Fall semester was not easy. We thank you for your support and governance and partnership through that process. But the steps we took worked. Our positivity rates were amongst the lowest of our university peers. We had no confirmed cases of COVID-19 transmission in a classroom and research space where students progressed uh, and advanced both in their learning and in their progress towards their degrees across our system. And this commitment and sacrifice across our university family made a huge difference. We were very grateful then and we remain grateful now to see it exemplified throughout the spring. Um, so far, many of our peers are already having to close or shut down as they experience surges on their campus. So far, that has not happened on any of our campuses this spring. We are strongly encouraging our university community to remain diligent in following public health guidelines to mask, retain social distance and avoid gatherings and hope that this will carry us through as it has so far. 
We're also looking forward to the light at the end of the tunnel uh, with vaccinations. And we're very committed to ensuring that all of our students, faculty and staff have equitable access to the vaccine. Our um, Health Emergency Response Office, also known as HERO, led by Director Jill DeBoer, who is my personal hero, is collaborating with the Minnesota Department of Health on a vaccine distribution process. Um, we are following the state's guidelines on the prioritization and work with them on how we receive the vaccine and then can distribute in our community and look forward to that funnel being widened over time as I know all of you are as well. So members of the board last month, I testified before both the Senate and House Higher Education Committees on our work to address last year's $65 million fiscal shortfall as you will recall, these efforts included a combination of federal CARES Act funding, university reserves, and very quick and rather dramatic steps to lower expenditures, such as holding fiscal year 2021 undergraduate and graduate tuition rates flat, along with most of the professional programs. We also um, froze fees. We took our merit salary increases out of the budget. We had a hiring freeze and we had furloughs and pay reductions weighted for those with the highest salaries taking largest reductions. Um, through this combination, we were able to meet that shortfall. Moreover, during this testimony, as well as in conversations with other legislative leaders, the governor, lieutenant governor, et cetera, in recent weeks, we highlighted the university's fiscal year 2022-2023 biennial budget request, which consists of only one category, operations and maintenance funding. We're addressing our shortfall ourselves, as you've heard us present uh, through Julie Tonnenson and Myron Franz's work with you, and that is ongoing through the budget cycle. But in partnership with the state, we are requesting a $15.5 million increase over our base for fiscal year 2022, and an additional 30.1 million for fiscal year 2023, totaling 46 and a half million. This is the lowest biennial budget request by the university in over 20 years, and it reflects a co-investment in how the university serves and partners with the state, but also reflects and recognizes that the state budget deficit is significant and real, and there are a limited set of options to solve a unique set of problems. So we think that investing in the university is an appropriate and worthwhile thing for the state to do, even in these difficult times, but presented an opportunity for them to do so in a way that allows them to also deal with the challenges that they're facing. So we look forward to continuing this important engagement and partnership with the state through the session and the biennial budget process. And of course, we will keep them posted. When we presented to the state, we focused our conversation around impact 2025. And I look forward to presenting to you in a few moments, the metrics and measures for action, including a refresh of the University of Minnesota progress card and the new University of Minnesota dashboard. But as you've heard already through this meeting and others, several components of the plan are well underway. You heard earlier about the master planning process. You've heard from the provost during mission fulfillment about equitable attainment. You've heard about how we're working on online education and health education with the Next Gen Med collaboration with the Mayo Clinic and Google. Um, you will hear later today from Dr. Cedric Alexander, who will speak to us about policing and safety. Um, with regard to student well-being and mental health, in the coming days, we will be announcing another important development, the launch of our student mental health initiative, which will call for nominations to support this trailblazing work. As you heard last time, we are calling this initiative PRISM. Uh, for the president. Joan, Joan, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Steves, there's, there's someone not muted with noise in the background. Maybe others can hear it. So if there's someone, if everyone can make sure they're muted uh, so that we can hear uh, the president's report. Sorry, John. No, of course. So the Student Mental Health Initiative is called PRISM, or the President's Initiative for Student Mental Health. It's a system-wide effort with a coordinated centralized communications function supported by university relations. It's going to represent the broad ecosystem of mental health, upstream efforts and partnerships, on-campus support and service delivery, and research opportunities into underlying cause or aggravating and mitigating circumstances on campus. It will be culturally responsive and sensitive and is tasked to consider where we can leverage who we are as an institution and our higher ed resources for students from the state of Minnesota and beyond. And I'm very pleased to report that the champions of this initiative 
our family social science professor, Tabitha Greer-Reed, and interim vice provost for student affairs, Maggie Towell, who will carry her leadership of this initiative into her new role. Because I'm also pleased to announce that we have a new vice president for student affairs, who will be an important partner, Dr. Calvin Phillips, who will join us officially on March 1st, pending board approval. Dr. Phillips is already onboarding well, attending leadership meetings and partnering with Maggie to ensure a smooth transition. We're all very excited to welcome him. My sincerest thanks to co-chairs of the search committee, Michael Goh and former Dean Jean Kwam and the entire committee for their willingness to serve in the search process and through this important hire for our university community. Um, other aspects of the strategic plan that we see reflected already underway include our new efforts around Indian affairs and our commitment to being good neighbors and partners to the tribal nations. To that end, we're currently seeking applications for an inaugural position called Senior Advisor to the President for Indian Affairs, which will report directly to me and will further our commitment to strengthening our partnership with our tribal nations. This is also a core component of our strategic plan. Another core component of our strategic plan and part of the administration's work to fulfill the board's charge from April 2019 to develop ongoing commemoration and educational activities that reflect our complex institutional history are, includes a launch from our office of the initiative called Voice, Art and Community, a UMN series. This series is in partnership with internal and external stakeholders and highlights important perspectives and voices in our community with the offer of a chance to connect with artists in an effort to create a platform for discussion around important social questions. The first event was on January 26th and was hosted and featured Resma Monacom, who many of you know. His event was entitled Racial Healing, Equity and Justice. We were proud also to join the Office for Student Affairs, the Robert J. Rones, excuse me, Robert J. Jones Urban Research and Outreach Center, also known as UROC, and other partners in sponsoring this event, which was part of the Kellogg Foundation's National Day of Racial Hearing, Healing event series. The second event, Crafting Black Visual Narratives in a Post-Uprising America, was on January 28th. This was a moderated conversation with black artists about their work and what it means to create black art in America and was also hosted by UROC. These events complement very well the work that we're doing in celebration of Black History Month. For Black History Month, the, uni the university launched a series called Where It Starts, which is a collection of personal stories highlighting the incredible accomplishments of our black community during their journey at the University of Minnesota. The series reflects upon overcoming obstacles, building community and finding purpose and was a collaborative effort between university relations and a team of faculty, staff and student content advisors from the university's black community. These efforts all tie in with the university's strategic plan and the work that we have underway to advance what we're doing as a community across all of the commitments reflected in that plan. We've also had a lot of events, um, despite the challenges posed by these interesting times we find ourselves in. I've had the opportunity to engage our community and beyond virtually in some interesting ways that I'd like to report to you. We offered welcoming remarks for our 40th anniversary MLK tribute concert. We visited again with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council as part of our ongoing commitment to regular meetings with that council. We joined Governor Walls and Charlie Weaver from the Minnesota Business Partnership for our 2021 legislative kickoff. I had the pleasure of doing a, a virtual fireside chat with Regent Beeson for a moderated conversation at the Sunrise Bank Business Breakfast Series. Um, I worked and had the pleasure of joining Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's Minnesota Executive Council for Young Women. I also joined national leaders from every major sector of the economy as part of my work as a commissioner for the U.S. Council on Competitiveness for their National Competitiveness Forum to offer insights as a panelist on the future of sustainable production, consumption, and work. And I did alumni events and uh, donor events with the Foundation and Alumni Association virtually in Florida and Texas, as well as with national colleagues at the NCAA's virtual convention. Members of the board, I'd like to close my report with what has become a practice with some shout outs that make us all UMN proud. So first, a shout out to University Relations for launching the Where It Starts series as part of Black History Month. 
A shout out to the recent edition of Wheels on Campus, a publication of New Mobility Magazine, which featured the University of Minnesota as number 11 amongst the top 20 wheelchair friendly campuses across the country. A shout out to University of Minnesota researchers who in collaboration with scientists from Australia, the United Kingdom and Denmark have developed a breakthrough gene technology that creates wheat crops with exceptional resistance to fungal disease that threatens wheat across the globe. A shout out to the interns at the University of Minnesota Duluth who were ranked number one nationally out of more than 3000 interns for sales production at Northwestern Mutual. A shout out to Gopher Football and the standouts who represented the university proudly on Super Bowl Sunday. The game featured the most former Gopher football players since 1970. A shout out to Bethany Haas and her recent Big Ten Women's Cross Country title, the first individual conference title for a Gopher woman in cross country since 1987 and only the second um, in all time. And I know this one especially makes Regent Anderson happy and everyone from Bethany and her exceptional twin sister Megan's hometown of Alexandria, Minnesota, UMN proud. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Chair Powell, you're muted. There we go, sorry. Uh, thank you for that report, uh, President Gable. Uh, I'd like to begin my, uh, my brief report by acknowledging uh, that uh, President Gable celebrated her birthday uh, earlier this week. So you kept that a secret, Joan, and on behalf of the entire board, very happy belated birthday. Um, thank you. It's, um, it's no secret that I'm uh, very excited to have the Impact 2025 system-wide strategic plan in place, uh, guiding the work of the university. I wanna briefly highlight just a couple of yesterday's uh, committee conversations uh, because they just completely align uh, with the plan. Uh, first, uh, the Mission Fulfillment Committee uh, had a very, very good discussion of student success uh, in underrepresented populations. Uh, this of course relates directly to uh, our commitment one and, and our, the student success goal, which is to attract and educate and graduate students who represent the diversity and talent, workforce and citizenship needs of the future. And then in the Finance and Operations Committee, we talked about campus master planning. We had a very good discussion there. And that, of course, relates uh, to commitment five uh, around fiscal stewardship to build comprehensive long-range capital facilities and land holding strategies to drive strategic growth. Uh, so those were both really good conversations. I think it's very, very positive for the advancement of our university that we continue to have this strong connection uh, between our governance work and our strategic plan. In our agenda today, we'll be taking action on metrics attached to MPACT 2025. This is another very important milestone uh, in this strategic work. And as a state supported land grant institution, I think these metrics are absolutely a critical component of the plan. Uh, they establish accountability uh, to uh, the university community, the legislature, and all Minnesotans. And so uh, I look forward to that conversation. And then later in our agenda, we'll be joined by Dr. Cedric Alexander, who will deliver his report and recommendations related to public safety on the Twin Cities campus. I know I speak for all of my region colleagues when I say that the health and safety of our students and the entire university community is paramount to this board and to university leadership. Dr. Alexander's report and recommendation will help inform our decisions going forward to ensure that everyone has a sense of safety and security on our campus. And I know we'll have a very uh, robust discussion uh, with, uh, on this topic with President Gable and Dr. Alexander. Finally, I'll note that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to drive discussions we have uh, and decisions we're making. <laughs> And I wanna thank the university community for continued patience and flexibility as we navigate you know, what is as ever an evolving public health guidance. Uh, I think and I hope that we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And I know you'll join me in continuing to follow public health recommendations until we're able to return to normalcy. So with that, we'll turn to the next item on our agenda. Uh, item four is the receive and file reports. Uh, please note uh, these reports uh, in your docket materials. 
Next, we will consider the consent report. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent report? Move to approve. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded, and I'll just pause to see if uh, any uh, there are any questions or comments uh, on the consent report. Mr. Steves, uh, do you see any hands raised? I am not seeing any. All right, without any questions or comments, then uh, I'll ask Mr. Steves to call the roll. On the consent report, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, thank you, Mr. Steves. The consent report uh, is approved. Now we'll move to uh, item six. Uh, this is uh, the impact 2025 measures. Uh, we had a formal review uh, and a very good discussion of this item at our December meeting. It is back before us uh, today for action. Uh, and it incorporates a number of changes uh, uh, that were suggested um, uh, during that um, uh, December discussion uh, that President Gable has included. So with that, I'll just turn it over to President Gable to um, guide us through the discussion. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sviggum, and members of the board. So as the chair mentioned, at the December 2020 meeting, we shared with you for review the proposed metrics for the MPAC 2025 new system-wide strategic plan the plan itself was approved by the board at the June 2020 meeting. Our shared metrics conversation and also our work to refresh the really groundbreaking progress card that the university had been using up to this point, and then the decision to establish a new dashboard began at the July 2020 retreat. Since then, the administration has been consulting widely with faculty, staff, students, alums, supporters, partners in the legislature, friends and stakeholders around the state, and of course with you, formally at the October 2020 and December 2020 meetings. As a result, MPAC 2025 and our path forward as a system is really much better. We've gleaned a lot of valuable insights, benchmarks, and we've received really useful contributions from every member of our university family. We're especially appreciative of the board's robust and continued engagement throughout this process, including the guidance and good suggestions that you shared at the December meeting. These insights, as well as those from across our university community over recent weeks are reflected through the addition of columns specifying distinct baselines and 2025 goals for all the measures as applicable and the fine tuning of various metrics from changing how we measure faculty promotion rates to reduce disparities as requested by several faculty members to highlighting the importance of the university's robust work to steward our state's natural resources. We've also added metrics for all five campuses in core areas from enrollment to four-year graduation rates to retention amongst others. Specific to our campuses in Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester, each respective chancellor will brief the board at a future meeting about how these specific measures, as well as their individual campus strategic plans align with MPAC 2025. A full list of the changes to the proposed MPAC 2025 metrics or measures since the December meeting is found in the docket summary for this agenda item. This includes changes across the three levels of accountability. Two in particular, which are most critical for board governance are the University of Minnesota Progress Card, which is noted in Appendix A in your docket, and then the highest level of accountability, the public facing MPAC 2025 dashboard, which is found in Appendix B. Also in Appendix B, you'll find a mock-up of what the dashboard website would look like. 
For each dashboard measure, there will be a click through allowing the viewer to see a more granular level of data, including supporting graphs and tables aimed at providing greater transparency and accountability. As highlighted at the December meeting for the board's purposes, the refreshed University of Minnesota progress card and then the new front facing dashboard will be the, mode, the roadmap that will help define the core achievements of the university and the administration as it implements and executes on MPAC 2025. It's also our intention that the refreshed University of Minnesota progress card serves as the bridge between the operations of the university and you as the board and your obligation and work with oversight of the accomplishments of the strategic plan. To this end, I bring to your attention MPAC 2025's final level of accountability, the broader MPAC 2025 plan itself. This is in your docket as Appendix C. This is what I use within the operations of the university as we track the work of the plan that then filters up to the progress card and then out to the general public through the dashboard. So members of the board, as we present to you updated measures and metrics for action today, I want to express my deep appreciation for the important work we've accomplished together and in it the shared commitment to advance the plan and what that means for the university, especially in the face of the broad challenges we've experienced over the last year. Through this work and in so many other ways, MPAC 2025 exemplifies that we are one system but five campuses strong working together from Crookston to Duluth, Morris to Rochester and to the Twin Cities in ways that ensure that our best days lie ahead. I also wanna give a particular shout out and thanks to Bill Haldeman who has been leading this charge and to the chancellors and vice presidents who've worked on each of the areas of the measures and metrics that reflect their work and their primary responsibility, but very importantly, how that work intersects with each other. I think you see that intersectionality really reflected in how the university is holding itself accountable. So with that, Mr. Chair, I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Gable. Um, and I'll just briefly comment. I want to thanks to you and your team for, you know, for updating uh, the progress card, for creating the dashboard, for taking this idea of metrics and driving it very, very deep into your organization. I think it's very good work. Um, colleagues, before we be begin our discussion, uh, I'd entertain a, a motion to approve um, the MPAC 2025 measures. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. So we'll turn to our discussion now. Uh, and again, use raise hand or alert Mr. Steves uh, if you uh, if you wish to uh, if you wish to speak. And um, I'm just scrolling through here to see if we have any any hands raised uh, yet. Mr. Steves, do you see any? We have Regent Beeson and Regent Mayron. All right. Let's begin with uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, President Gable, this is an improvement over the draft we saw in, uh, in December. Uh, it's more uh, specific. Uh, it has um, uh, stronger goals. Uh, and I, so I applaud uh, that, uh, th uh, that change that you and Mr. Holden and others have, uh, have made. I could argue for a, um, slightly higher goal for the medical school ranking. I thought we could be a little more aggressive there, but we do show some improvement. We certainly have shown improvement over the last uh, three or four years. Um, I, could also, I could also argue about the ACT. You've got a very wide band from 25 to 31. Um, and you know, this, is, this, is the, this is an issue the board will be dealing with. We've talked about it, we, we're, we're, we're not, requiring standardized testing for the next uh, next year or two. But, um, you know, we have been able to create a more diverse population of undergraduates, both, both demographically and economically, while at the same time increasing our ATC, ACT scores. So they're not mutually exclusive. It is more work. It's more expensive. It requires a more, more of a focus. But to me, that checks all the boxes when we can we can recruit and secure the most prepared students and standardized testing for the Twin Cities, I think is a great tool uh, for, uh, for the admission staff who will have to sort through 45,000 applications for a class of 5,000. But overall, I, I think this is a great roadmap. It will help protect the administration and guide the administration both as they, you know, as we sort of move through so many 
so many issues and so many urgencies. So uh, I, I will lend my support to this and thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, President Gable, uh, do you, would you like to respond or any commentary uh, um, following Regent Beeson's uh, comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to thank Regent Beeson, and I will note just for the discussion that our original progress card was really his um, baby, if you will. Um, it was groundbreaking. Many of us, um, myself included, who were at other institutions at the time followed it. It has guided everything we've done going forward. So I'm very grateful for the support today and for the work that preceded it that have put us in the position that we're in now. Uh, yes, indeed, President Gable. And, and I, I would certainly concur with that. And, and you've taken something that was very good and I think uh, expanded it. Uh, Regent Mayron. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I am... Um, to be frank, I'm just blown away, uh, President Gable, by what you've been able to accomplish uh, in terms of the strategic plan. Um, when I was seeking election here as a regent a couple of years ago, so high on my agenda was the commitment to work with the president of the university to develop a strategic plan with, which would carry us forward. And you not only did that, but you did it in such a sophisticated and forward thinking way. So I wanna thank you and your staff uh, for what you've developed. And again, using your collaborative style, getting gaining input from so many constituencies in order to create a strategic plan that not only drives the university forward, but uh, the state of Minnesota and beyond. So, kudos to you uh, and everyone who worked on this, whether it's Mr. Haldeman or everyone else, it's a, it's a fabulous result. Um, second, I just wanted to say uh, to the board, I did talk with President Gable earlier this week about uh, questions that I had with respect to the metrics and then how it shows up on the, um, on the progress card, noting that there were um, some items that uh, uh, committed to establishing a baseline uh, for a number of different uh, items, but then under the goal for 2025 said not applicable. And I shared with President Gable that I did think once those baselines were established or those data or surveys were completed at that time, my hope would be that the administration would then jump on it and create metrics uh, for goals for 2025, even though right now, it's not showing up in the plan. In other words, my view is it's not enough to, to create a baseline. We now have to talk about where it is we wanna take the university on those particular items uh, into the future and through 2025. And I understand, but President Gable can speak to that, that that is something that she assumed would happen um, and was committed, but I'll let President Gable respond to that. I also raised with President Gable, um, I, how much I appreciated that she and her uh, staff went back and put in metrics on some of the items that didn't have them, either what would be accomplished or dates by which uh, they would be accomplished. And I noted to her, there were still some that didn't have that. It just said improve year after year. And we talked about that. And um, again, President Gable can correct me if I'm misrepresenting it, but uh, my understanding is the reason those don't have specific measures is because the reality is that she and her administration cannot come up with or are not able to develop measures at this point that are objective that could be in fact stated and that she could commit to achieving. And so uh, I understand, you know, in the best of all worlds, we'd like to have objective measures on every one of these items but there are some that are just not amenable to it by the very nature of what we're addressing. And I was satisfied with her response, but again, President Gable could address it if she would like. But long and short, this is just an incredible endeavor and outcome, so thank you. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Regent uh, Mayron, for those comments. President Gable, uh, baselines and uh, additional goals, uh, are, those will be on their way. Or do you want to uh, re respond or comment on Regent Mayron's remarks? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Regent Mayron. So yes, uh, uh, as expected, Regent Mayron um, precisely summarized our uh, earlier conversation 
Um, and what we discussed and what the administration was presuming, but that I'm very happy to state formally and commit to formally is that for some of the activities that we describe in the metrics, the first step is to launch them. They're, they're, they need to exist. And then once they're launched, and so one of the measures is for that to happen, whatever that may be. And then once it happens, we would come before you with how we would measure its success. So it was diff we didn't um, have a mechanism to identify the measure of success for something that didn't exist yet. So we've broken those into the two steps. Once it exists, then we would update the scorecard or if it's dashboard worthy in the dashboard um, with a specific measure. So we commit to doing that. And then with regard to the remaining metrics that are on what I would call a qualitative trajectory where we seek improvement year over year, um, we filtered out uh, as many of those types of measures as possible. The ones that remain that way, we believe should remain that way for the reasons that Regent Mayeron describes. They're either subjective or are they're new. Our peers aren't doing them. So we don't have anyone to measure against but ourselves. Um, or we're awaiting um, a different mechanism of identifying the appropriate data. Um, and so to set a target now would be too much of a guess. And while all projections have some element of, of um, educated guess. Uh, some were just too loose, but it didn't mean we didn't want to do them. And it didn't mean we didn't want to hold ourselves accountable. So we hold ourselves accountable for improvement. As more data becomes available, in some cases, I could see us switching to a specific measure. But the ones that are in the metrics that way are that way after much thought and reflection about what was available to us as alternatives. All right. Thank you, President Mayron. Uh, Regent McMillan, at one point you had your hand up. Do you still wish to uh, have the floor? Thank you, but I just wanted to say I'm no, I'm not a president, so I'm just a mere no. regent on this. <laughs> You've been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Regent, At this point, uh, I'm fine. I don't have anything to add. Okay, you're That's you're all. good, Regent McMillan. All right. Thank That's you. We'll, we'll have, then uh, go on to. We have four regents in the queue. Uh, yes, I see. Regent, regent Anderson is next. Anderson, then Rosha, Shu, her. After that. Very good, thank you. Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Paul. I just have a couple comments. Uh, again, a work in progress with this. A thank to, to Regent Beeson. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna also give a shout out to Regent Rocha on his uh, insistence that we work on increasing the percentage of Minnesota high school graduates that, that come to our campuses. And, and I'm, um, I see that we have a confirmed number for that by 2025. And I, I think that's good because as a land grant institution, uh, it is those people and their parents that are paying taxes to fund this institution. So the higher we can get that percentage, I'm, I'm all for it. My final question comes on, and, and I don't know if President Gable wants to answer this. It's, it's more of a comment, I just don't know. Uh, distributed learning methods. That's one of the things that we are gonna have not have a number on, it's gonna increase over time, increase over time. Um, my question in that, is the jury still out on this being, you know, we've learned a lot in the COVID situation. Is the jury still out on this being an improvement to learning or is it more in the side of a marketing issue that gives people who will potentially come to the University of Minnesota an amenity or another ability or way to attend? Uh, do you have a comment on that? Uh, Improvement to learning as an amenity. President Gable, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regent Anderson, I would say it's both. And let me say why I think so. So there is a lot of data, online learning is not new, and there's a lot of data that shows that it is, um, in, it is equal as a learning tool. It may not be preferred, but in terms of distributing information and advancing an understanding of that information, it is equal as a learning tool. So because of that, it can be an amenity for students who are working and wanna take one of their classes online while they take a few in person when we're back to that option. It creates flexibility in scheduling. It requires less physical space to offer the instruction. It has other um, physical needs in terms of technology and instructional support. But for, from the student point of view, it creates some flexibility. But because it, 
is a, a quality way to learn for the students who want it that way. It gives us the ability to literally meet students where they are, whether it's because of the circumstances that Regent Simonson described yesterday, where students don't feel comfortable leaving their home community in order to attend school. They have a physical disability that makes their ability to go back and forth to campus limited. We could come up with a lot of reasons why students would want to do their learning away from campus, it gives us the capacity to do so. We did that before the pandemic, but the pandemic opened this up in a whole other way. And so now we see how that both opens the funnel for where we might put distributed learning, but also inspires entirely new ways of doing distributed learning like the Next Gen Med collaboration with Google and the Mayo Clinic. Thank you, that answers my question. That's, that's kind of the way I viewed it also. Thank you, Chair Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'll be fairly quick here. I want to just say, I'll, I'll join the chorus of uh, Regents uh, talking about the, the incredible progress here. This is fantastic. Um, I'm so impressed with, with how this has developed and the fact that it now has, it, well, I shouldn't say now has, but the, the greater uh, inclusion of metrics that are clear, useful, um, thank you, President Gable, um, for, for your work and your, the work of your team on this. Um, I, I want to touch, you know, kind of weigh in on the, like for, on the ACT score metric, for instance. I, I think you're on the right track here. Um, I like what you have put in place. Um, I believe that there is a, a correlation between ACT scores and, and uh, preparation and success, uh, future success. We, we, uh, I think the the national data reflects that, but I also think that an institution of our size and with our mission, we have to have the ability to uh, to reach out to uh, communities that maybe haven't come in with the same uh, preparation for ACT testing. Uh, I think we have to also take into account that uh, different people learn in different ways. Um, I, I call this the Norman Borlaug effect. Um, somebody who had a, a learning disability that would likely have prevented him from entering the University of Minnesota, not only was admitted to the U, but has you know, had an incredible uh, global impact. And so um, don't necessarily wanna move completely away from, from the opportunity for people that have those uh, various backgrounds, wh whichever community they come from. Um, the last thing I'll just talk about is as we look at these metrics going forward, and, and of course there's a lot of them, so not necessarily looking just to add more, but I think going forward, we do have to talk about the geographic representation um, in, in particular for the Twin Cities campus. Um, I think that you know, we already know that the, the data shows that there's a bit of a gap there. Um, and I appreciate uh, Regent Anderson's comments a moment ago. Uh, but I think that it's important not only for meeting our mission, but for maintaining state support, uh, especially at the legislature, to, to, for folks to recognize that we are seen as a, as an, uh, a, a resource for the entire state. Our, our system campuses do an amazing job in that space. Um, I think that we do have to keep our eye on the ball with respect to um, uh, the Twin Cities campus. And so as we go forward, I just want to um, put that put that in front of the of the board for future discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha, for those good comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Regent, uh, Regent Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, President Gable, for this wonderful um, metrics and progress uh, report card. I totally am on board. I, I, I buy it. I see a lot of myself in it. Um, going back to uh, the early days when we started putting this together, didn't know how it would turn out, but um, it's, it's definitely providing a, a roadmap that I can get on. Um, and I, I can see results um, at the end of it. And so I think we're doing something new. Um, I think this will make us into something that we've not been, um, creating a lot of new things. And so I'm just really happy to see it. And I'm really happy to be making a vote today um, so that um, we, can, we can continue the great work in progress. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Herb. Uh, I believe uh, next up, it was uh, Regent Shu. Hello, am I here? Am I here? Okay. Yeah, we hear we hear you now. All right, I dropped off for a while. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, repeating anybody's uh, comments, but um, I want to echo um, all the accolades for this. This is uh, 
really great work. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I do want to uh, go back to something that Regent Beeson talked about. Um, and I think there might be actually an error in the way that the um, ACTs are presented. Uh, the ACT should be um, presented where the most recent um, most recent average is on the right, unless I'm looking at the wrong page. I'm looking at page 105. Um, it goes 20, 28.4, 28.4, 28.3, 28.0 uh, from left to right, and I think it should be reversed. But anyway, having said that, uh, I want to just make the point that uh, while there still may be a place for ACTs going forward, I, I think that test optional is, is something that we should really consider as a permanent um, uh, policy. And all that means is that people are allowed to apply and that we will look at their application if they don't submit a test score. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, as a byproduct of that, um, applications do go up and ACT scores do go up. So uh, I think there's a benefit in doing that and also we're making sure that we're um, allowing people to uh, submit them themselves for application or their applications, um, even though they may not um, have a, either a test score or a good test score. Um, Aside from that, uh, another comment about the, the medical school rankings. I, yeah, I think um, we could be more aggressive than that, but I think uh, being in the top 20 um, actually is, uh, is quite an uh, achievement that uh, we, we would be proud of if we could achieve it. So uh, aside from that, I support, uh, the, um, uh, I support the document and uh, look forward to seeing what can happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Regent Shu. Thank you for the uh, for the comment, uh, President Gale. Uh, get, uh, any uh, any thoughts or reactions to uh, Regent Shu's comments? Uh, no, I appreciate the feedback, and um, I believe actually we'll we'll double check Regent Shu um, on how we reported that uh, ACT score. I believe it's actually in there correctly that it that is what happened in that order, but I'll double check it and make sure that as it posts that we have it confirmed as accurate. Okay, thank you, President Gable. Um, Chair Powell, uh, we have um, Regent McMillan, Kenyanya, and Davenport. On that. Yep, that, that's the order we'll go in. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, I too am very supportive and have been for a long time of increasing the Minnesotans that we get into, I'm gonna word this carefully, the University of Minnesota system. And the metrics that are here, I think for the first time ever support a system-wide approach where my fear comes and is, is the following. If, if that is a UM Twin Cities increase goal, and we don't take into account a flat to declining Minnesota high school graduate demographic situation, what I'll consider to be rampant overcapacity in public and private for your higher ed in the state already. And we're talking about lowering ACT standards at the Twin Cities. It can't work out well for the rest of, I won't say anything about public, but, or about private, but for the rest of the public higher ed institutions, four-year institutions in the state. Even if we win the battle of keeping all of Minnesota's best and brightest here right now, we, I, I just don't see it working out well for everybody else down the food chain from the Twin Cities campus. So I'm not against any of that. I just think we have to make changes to what the Twin Cities campus is doing with admission standards, recruiting, size of class, with the rest of the U of M system in mind and understanding that there are ripple effects, major ripple effects at the other public system in the state and perhaps for the privates as well. So just system holistic approaches to this are what President Gables brought to the table, I think for the first time. And you will find me supportive of us chasing these metrics or of President Gable and her administration chasing them 
us refining them from time to time. But until we come to grips with the fact that we're not going to get any more high school graduates in from a demographic standpoint in Minnesota, and the more that go to the Twin Cities, um, we have to win the battle with keeping them from going to Stanford and Wisconsin and everywhere else in order to hold our own. So it's just there, there's big consequential issues to changing what happens at the Twin Cities downstream. And I'm probably a broken record on that, but it, we just have to keep that in mind as we uh, as we push President, uh, as we set metrics for President Gable to pursue. So that's it. I've, I've stated before that her President Gable's ability with Bill Haldeman at the at the lead, his ability, their ability to keep this thing front and center through a pandemic is stunning and uh, very, very grateful. I like everything here, but let's just make keep in mind when we mess around here with what the Twin Cities is doing, big time downstream ripple effects for everybody else. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Regent McMillan, for for that um, for that that caution. Um, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Madam President, for the presentation and all the work. You and I spoke this week, and I applauded this privately, and I'll, I'll do it again uh, publicly um, for you know getting this done, but also getting it done um, in the circumstances we're in. Um, I, I think the the dashboard is very clean, easy to digest, and I want to call out you know what was written in here, in that you can dive in, you know, you can click on something and, and find out more about that specific metric. Um, so I think it will be easily digestible. I have a couple points of feedback um, on, on just a couple of these metrics where I think we're, we're highlighting uh, an important area, but maybe there's a different uh, metric that might challenge us a little more that we can display. Um, and those are the ones on 69 of the docket or nine, nine, slide nine of the presentation, I think. But um, so one, looking at the climate survey, um, the number we're tracking, you know, putting, since it's based on the overall student body, we know it's skewed, right? Um, in that, that 86% is probably not equal to, but somewhat similar to our, our population of non-students of color, right? Um, so maybe there's a different metric there um, that's that, that next step in that we could possibly track there because, you know, 86 sounds good, but then, okay, how does that compare to to, you know, yeah, I see you nodding. So that one's pretty clear. The next one, um, job satisfaction. And again, this could be me reading these wrong, but I, that's feedback in itself. Job satisfaction, um, three out of four U of M employees are highly committed and dedicated to their work. Um, it, it, that sounds like, um, it, that doesn't sound like job satisfaction. It's like job en enrichment or something. As in, you could be, you could be highly committed and dedicated to your teaching, um, but are you happy in that department? Are you happy in that college? Do you feel you're treated uh, fairly? Um, so this is an important metric, but maybe there's one more about their, their happiness, not just commitment, right? Because I think all our faculty and staff are committed to the mission. It doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're happy with their current situation. And then for operational excellence, um, I, I guess I would, for that one, I suppose, you know, it is a click through dashboard so you can click and find more information, but it doesn't tell me much. Um, maybe might be an opportunity to add a number. I know we're not trying to get super specific on everything, but that was another one that uh, didn't, didn't, I didn't feel like it, you know, it, it was super clear on, on what it's saying. But um, besides those three points, fantastic job. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, to, to seeing and interacting with this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam President. Thank, thank you, Regent Kenyonia, for those comments. Uh, I see one more uh, Regent, Re, uh, Regent Davenport who would like to comment. Thank you, Chair Powell and President Gable. I simply want to add my support to the work and the effort, but also recognize that some of the concerns that have been raised really ought to be part of our own work plans, um, our own work moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent, uh, Regent Davenport. So I don't see any other uh, hands raised. And um, just if I could, uh, President Gable, I know you're taking notes here, but let me just, you know, add my, my praise to this very good work. I think this is really an outstanding uh, and, and highly detailed framework for us.
but I appreciate your acknowledgement that there are, you know, elements of this that are still, you know, a somewhat of a work in progress. Um, and uh, to that end, you said, look, there are some baselines that are still coming. There are goals that are still coming. There are some qualitative measures that, you know, aren't, you know, uh, you know, completely, uh, you know, kind of rock hard. They're going to require uh, discussion and judgment. Uh, there are some numbers, as we just heard from Regent Kenyanya, where, you know, the one number doesn't tell the story. There's nuance. We'll have to go deeper. And I, President Gable, I think I heard you acknowledge all of those points, um, and which I think uh, is an important part of this discussion. Before I wrap it up, President Gable, any concluding comments that you would like to make? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I would just um, steal shamelessly from what you just said <laughs> and uh, reflect that um, strategic planning is organic. You set up an architecture and then you start the work and then sometimes things emerge uh, that either clarify or um, suggest different directions. And what this does is give us the, the structure to have those discussions openly and transparently. It would be, in my opinion, um, not only normal, but a positive if we end up editing on occasion what we have here in order to dive deeper, in order to clarify as data becomes available or as circumstances or times suggest. So this is um, robust, it will guide us, but it is not, um, it is organic and it will evolve for exactly the reasons that you described. All right, thank you, President Gable. I don't see any other uh, hands raised, so we'll move now to call the roll. On approval of the MPAC 2025 measures, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mehron. Yes. Regent Mehron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. Very good measure of motion passes unanimously. I'd like to thank everyone for their high engagements uh, in this process and President Gable and her team. I really think this is a great step uh, forward for us. Our next item uh, also requires our action today and that is uh, approval of the 2020 University Performance and Accountability Report. Uh, we had a formal review uh, of this report last month there have been no substantive changes uh, to the report. And so uh, we'll forego any formal presentation from President Gable and Provost Croson uh, this morning. I'll entertain a motion to approve the report uh, and then we'll uh, take the opportunity for uh, questions or comments. Uh, is there a motion to approve the 2020 University Performance and Accountability Report? So moved, so Mr. Chair. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right, thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, we'll turn to our discussion. We Again, raise hand or Zoom if you'd like to speak. I will just say while, while waiting that again, in, in reviewing this again, uh, President Gable, uh, I think you, you and your team have uh, really nicely advanced this report. It's concise. Uh, it's really full of information. It's very easy to use. I think it'll be a, a, an excellent tool uh, for us with all of our uh, various constituencies. Uh, uh, and, and so um, um, I, I think it really, it really kind of has advanced uh, our cause here. Thank you very much to your team. I don't see... Uh, I don't see any hands raised. And I know we did have had, you know, a very thorough discussion of this. Seeing that there are no questions or comments, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Steves to call the roll. On approval of the accountability report, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. 
Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron? Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, by a vote of 12 to zero, the 2020 University Performance and Accountability Report is approved. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll now turn to item eight. And I would like first to welcome Dr. Cedric Alexander, uh, along with President Gable, to lead us through the discussion on public safety. Dr. Alexander has recently completed a comprehensive public safety review he and President Gable will walk us through that report and their recommendations. So President Gable, I'll turn it over to you to begin. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. Um, so all of this discussion that we are about to have and have had in various occasions is around our shared desire to have a safe campus environment, but with a recognition that there are different circumstances that make people feel safe or unsafe depending on their lived experience and personal background. Recent months and events have inspired us to reflect more about what that means. What does it mean to feel safe? What does it mean to feel respected, to feel a sense of dignity, to feel a sense of inclusion across our university family and beyond? And also, what does it mean for us to be in our best position to respond to emergencies or crises as they have and will continue to occur? So to advance this important work, to look at safety from these multiple dimensions and perspectives, the university selected C.L. Alexander Consulting, led by Dr. Cedric Alexander. He is a noted academic, a civic leader, and an expert in law enforcement with over 40 years of public safety experience to conduct a comprehensive review of public safety on campus, on and around specifically the Twin Cities campus. The intent of the review was to identify ways in which the values, practices, and experiences of the campus community aligned with those of the University of Minnesota Police Department, or as we generally refer to them, UMPD. And to also look at ways, despite the fact that we have a very high opinion of UMPD, where the university and its police department could work together to improve or to align more closely with the community expectations. So beginning in September 2020, Dr. Alexander and his team facilitated conversations with more than 200 individuals, including students, faculty, staff, parents, alums, members of the public safety team, some members of the board, and over 30 organizations through representation of these individuals across the campus. Dr. Alexander also received online and written submissions and reviewed traditional and social media and did some review of UMPD practices and training. Members of the board, Dr. Alexander's report is comprehensive, thoughtful, and honest. It cites something that we have discussed before that he refers to as an undeniable tension between those who feel more policing is the solution and those who feel that more policing is the problem. It also offers dozens of proposed recommendations across eight broad categories, some of which we seek to implement immediately, including UMPD officers, uh, having the body camera equipment, continuing regular meetings, which we've already commenced with the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul to keep open lines of communication and coordinate in a more thoughtful and purposeful way on public safety issues in neighboring communities, purchasing and distributing it, the Rave Guardian campus app or a similar app to all students, faculty and staff and transitioning Department of Public Safety or UMPD oversight to Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Myron Franz. Members of the board, in addition to our continued engagement with Mayors Carter and Fry, I'm also working very closely with Senior Vice President Franz and our Chief, Matt Clark, to operationalize these recommendations. There are also many other recommendations included in Dr. Alexander's report. Those require some consideration and analysis his recommendations range from adding officers to UMPD, increasing our 911 capacity, and adding blue call boxes across campus and in neighboring communities. But in order to really think about whether these recommendations are acted upon or in what order or in what way, he recommends standing up an implementation committee, and we're doing so. We're standing up the MSAFE implementation team, 
which will be led by co-chairs Dr. Kathy Quick, who's an associate professor in the Humphrey School, and Dr. Mylene Colbraith, who's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the Graduate School Diversity Office. And then we'll take nominations to have representative faculty, staff, and students on the implementation team. We'll also look for shared governance process and from other key stakeholders to provide committee representation and feedback along with the consultation process. We have a nomination process underway and we'll be able to identify the remaining members of this important team very soon. Ultimately, MSAFE implementation team will be an advisory committee. They will review Dr. Alexander's recommendations, engage in follow-up consultation as needed and gather that feedback and then provide an action plan to Vice President Franz, Chief Clark, me, and also the newly formed University Senate Campus Safety Committee that we reported to you um, at our last meeting. We will update you regularly on this progress and to the extent that their recommendations require board approval, we will obviously bring them forward to you as appropriate. So members of the board, doc, while Dr. Alexander's report explicitly focuses on areas for improvement, I wanna note that it also recognizes the considerable strengths of UMPD. This department has taken on significant steps to broaden officer skill sets in de-escalation, in mental health, in cultural sensitivity, and in community relationships. They have implemented nationally recognized and forward-looking approaches from the 21st Century Task Force on Policing and Campaign Zero's Eight Can't Wait program to instill policies and practices aimed at improving trust and legitimacy. And this commitment is ongoing as reflected in their partnership in this review and in their willingness to change so that they can best fulfill UMPD's mission to serve the Twin Cities campus. It's a unique jurisdiction with a unique community and we can always get better in order to serve that community. So in closing, before I turn it over to Dr. Alexander who will continue the presentation and go into the details on the report, I want to express my sincere appreciation to all who've shared their important voice and unique experiences throughout this process. And thanks in advance to those who will continue to do so as we engage in this important work in the coming weeks ahead. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll turn it over to Dr. Alexander. All right, thank you, President Gable. Uh, Dr. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Gable. And also thank you, Chairman Power and Powell and to the Board of uh, Regents giving me an opportunity to be here with you today. I'm really, to be honest with you, I have been looking forward to having this conversation and certainly entertaining any questions that uh, you, you all may have around this venture that you uh, decided to, to take part in. But let me start by saying this, and if you would indulge me for a few minutes, because I think it's important for me to set the background, one of how I got here and the challenges that were associated with the initial uh, uh, questioning process in which we got to where we are to this final report. Uh, it was in late August of 2020 uh, that President uh, Gable uh, reached out to me and asked me to address some of the concerns which he just uh, uh, eloquently articulated as it relates to the university and to the UMPD. Uh, and I accepted that, that invitation. I was very fortunate to have uh, and was able to garner a, uh, uh, a really unique and talented group of individuals who helped in this process and who have had extreme and extensive experience around police reform uh, in this country. And that included one organization, Strategic Applications International, that quite frankly wrote the document of the 21st Century Task Force Report in which I have the privilege to be a part of. Their unique work that was identified and accepted by the White House and the President Obama really lends to itself the important kind of work that they do and the ability to do this work without bias and with balance. Uh, and it was a great privilege for me to be able to work with them. Uh, this particular group as well also have done work in your home state there in Minnesota. They facilitated the Minnesota Working Group on Police Deadly Force Encounters, uh, which was led by your state attorney general and also your state commissioner of public safety. 
part of the process to get with where we are today as this report was developed over the last several months, as you heard the president state, there were over 70 meetings, over 200 individuals, which I had an opportunity uh, to interface with either in person or uh, via Zoom, mostly via Zoom. And some of the initial key findings, uh, and we certainly can go over any and all of this report, uh, take as long as we would, you feel is needed to do so. But some of the key findings in this was the fear of increasing crime on your campus. And there was concerns, particularly around the reaction of the death following the death, following the death of uh, George Floyd and how the community in and around your campus thought the importance of how is it that we want to be police became an emerging issue. There are those on your campus who view M UMPD as a solution to feeling safe, the fear of crime. And then there's those on your campus also who don't feel safe and who fear the police. Both can be true at the same time. And that is evidenced, of course, by what we see, not as just, just happening to your, on your campus, but this is across the country as it relates to American policing today. Your institution and the challenges that you have following the death of George Floyd and before is not unique to your institution. It is a symptom of a larger issue that we see taking place across, these, across this country. We also, <clears throat> UMPD, I must note, has taken a number of aggressive steps towards police reform. And that has to be highlighted here, that has to be noted, and it has to be recognized. Their, tree, uh, uh, their training, key concepts are topics around de-escalation, use of force, constitutional policing, procedural justice, et cetera. They have done great work around community engagement teams where they have had over, met with or had over 500 events over the course between 2018 and 2019. And the university in of itself as well too, we must note is a university campus police and not an urban police department. A number of concerns were raised in this, port, in this report, and I'm quite sure you read them. Militarization of UMPD and the perceived or the real militarization of policing on your campus certainly was a top and very hot issue. But here again, it's not just an issue that is relegated to your campus. We hear it across the country, even in municipal policing, large cities, moderate sized cities, small cities. Oftentimes it has been reported, some of the concerns is that many of your students, Falcon and their staff, have a difficult time differentiating between UMPD and MPD, Minneapolis Police Department. And that in itself may be of some concern because maybe some of the statements and allegations being made toward UMPD may be based on the fact that people cannot differentiate the difference between the two if they are interacted by, or they come up on some interaction by Minneapolis police. That is their belief and that is their perception. And for many of them, that is their reality. So there were a number of recommendations, a large number of recommendations that have been made to the university in terms of how can we align what is challenging there one, how people perceive police as being there to support them and being helpful. People who spoke very highly of UMPD, those who respect the organization and protect them, that protect them in their daily lives. But then you have another set of people who experience police in a very different way. Whether it is real or perceived, it's not for me or any of us to litigate. This was a listening session. And the listening session here for me meant just that. Very early on, I came to your campus in late August, early September. I wanted to physically be on campus because I felt it was important for me to get a feel of that environment, even though I was a thousand miles away. And I had an opportunity to spend three or four days there on your campus, had a number of meetings with students, faculty, staff, either in person or on Zoom. But it was 
an experience for me to have an opportunity to walk around your university campus there, to meet your chief and to meet others that were, I have to be very honest with you, were very warm and were very delightful to talk to and to be with. But what also became very evident to me during my time on campus when I met with those in person initially is some things that I had to learn of myself that really had, I had to be quite aware of. And the difference is here between your students, your faculty and your staff and your police department. Both sides feel that there would be some deference shown to me being a former police officer. And would I be able to come up and do this inquiry and present to you a balanced report? That was a challenge I had to overcome. Students and faculty made that very clear to me, a few did, during my visit, during my interviews. But that is part of the process. It wouldn't have been, it would not have been of any value to me to be defensive about it, but to listen to it. The other piece that I had to learn through this process for myself was to be quiet and to listen. And I was informed and reminded that you're here to listen to us, Dr. Alexander, we're not here to listen to you. So I took that to heart. I tend to be verbose at times, which many of us are, but it was also an opportunity in the climate that that university is in, in the way people feel about their police their institution, it was important for me to listen and to listen attentively. Everything that was gathered in this report was based on the experiences of others. Some perceived, some shared their own experiences. And let me be clear, some of these experiences that were shared, people show a great deal of affect around them. And even those who may not have been uh, directly themselves, uh, uh, had contact in some negative kind of way, whether it was their perception or whether it was with your campus police or your city police there. There were many who reported the relationships and the incidents that their friends may have had. And they too shared with that with a great deal of affect. The whole spirit of this report for us and my team was to do one thing and one thing only, is to take the charge that the president had given us to be able to look at what is the safety on that campus? How is it perceived? How do people understand it? How do they feel about it? And also they ask people to share their experience, both what is good and what has been challenging around public safety for them. When that used the term, what was negative or what was bad, but what is the challenge? And what you have before you here is a report that report exactly that. Is it going to be agreeable to everyone that picks it up and read it? Of course not, because there are a number of different factions that's going to read this. This report is going to look different for students and faculty and staff. It's going to look different for police. It's going to look different to many other entities that are out there who will pick it up. And people will have a lot to say about it. Some will have a little to say about it. But at the end of the day, this is not me reporting personally. This is what I'm delivering to the institution as to what your students, your faculty, your staff, and your police department reported to us. And trying to deliver in a way, deliver it to you in a way that is fair, that is balanced, as comprehensive as that we can make it. But the most important thing for us is that it was thoughtful. And we spend a great deal of time and hours going through that with things around police and community that were still evolving as this report was being built. So I want to be able to uh, share with you today and certainly entertain any questions that you may have around this report, but it truly is about moving forward. There are no bad guys here. You have an outstanding police department that has done incredible work to work hard to try to build those relationships, but the challenges are still there. And it's not relegated strictly to your institution. We see this around the country. I have friends and colleagues who work with me in the White House on the 21st Century Task Force report 
who just completed their work for Harvard and Yale in Syracuse is still in progress. And some of the same themes that emerge here emerging, is emerging across other institutions across this country who are challenging themselves to do better. Not saying that anybody is bad or anyone is doing anything wrong, but the charge was the president to the, from the president to me was, Dr. Alexander, how do we make it better? How do we align ourselves in a way which everyone, everyone, regardless of who they are or where they're from on this planet, feel safe and feel that they have a good relationship with their campus police department. So I would encourage that we take this report not as something negative, but as an opportunity for us to progress. You have a good police department, you have an outstanding faculty, and you have the ability here because of being the research and respected institution that you are in this country to help progress these recommendations along. Are the recommendations long and in depth? Yes, they are. The hard work now begins. The easy work was putting the report together. The real challenge is now, how do we walk through reform? How do we begin to think about where we wanna take our university around public safety and around building those relationships. And for me, that's what it's about. And I hope that I have a delivered report here to your institution overall, regardless of my background, that shows no difference, but really is factual, it's comprehensive, and it's not full of fluff. It is full of practical ideas and experiences that people either share in real time or people perceived as being an issue for them. So with that, I will stop here and I would um, certainly look forward to any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for those uh, comments, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander um, and um, President Gable. Um, you, uh, I think, you know, working collaboratively, collaboratively with Dr. Alexander, you selected um, a number of recommendations uh, from the report that you wanted to move on, uh, uh, you know, right away. And then obviously there are many others, uh, you know, in the report that and you've, you've talked about how you're going to be addressing those. I wonder if before we um, open it up to, um, the board for questions and comments. It might be useful, uh, President Gable, either for you or you with Dr. Alexander to talk about the, the, the priority actions that you want to initiate right away and then maybe uh, so, some, some other uh, priorities that you would see for the uh, implementation team. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So as I mentioned to the board in my um, memo when we provided the report, there are a few things in the report that um, have already come before the board for some level of discussion or that seems so patently helpful um, that there did not appear to be any reason to wait. Not that they don't require some foundational work in order to stand up, but the endorsement as recommendations that we would ask act upon we um, have already started. So those are to do the implementation team as, recommenda as recommended, which I uh, referred to earlier, to start working on the body cams, which is a process, but one that we're already undertaking um, to think about a safety app um, and to start working with the mayors, um, though meetings have already started, and then to reorganize the public safety department to reflect its importance and have it report to the senior vice president. So those were all recommendations in the report that we have already either committed to doing or have done and, and well, started, I believe would be the more accurate word. So um, otherwise the recommendations um, have more of a, a long game shared governance um, review component. So those would go through the implementation team as suggested in the report. All right, and President Gable, just while I'm a quick follow-up for you, you've mentioned a couple times, and and uh, uh, Dr. Alexander, you know, uh, and and you know, comments on this in his in his report and others as well extensively. This 
you know, the challenging issue of the, of the, you know, the fact that we're a, 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 a very big town, but surrounded by two very large cities. And so the whole, all the, the border issues and how we work co collaboratively with uh, the city of St. Paul and the city of Minneapolis. And I know that, um, you know, you are in regular contact now, you know, with, with the mayors and those departments. And I'm wondering if perhaps you can give us a little bit of commentary on, uh, you know, just broadly speaking, what what you're what you're pursuing there, and kind of the status of those conversations, because it does seem to me that those that is a critical area. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So it's um, our relationship with our neighboring mayors and councils predates um, the crisis circumstances that have emerged since George Floyd's death, and predate the recommendation in the report. But it had been. Um, uh, a conversation that happened usually amongst our staff, from staff to staff, uh, to talk about public safety, shared commands, shared patrol. So to elevate the conversation from me directly to the mayors was new, at least for me. It may have occurred in previous administrations. And so the discussion was, what does it mean for us to think about um, shared patrol, shared response, the possibility of shared community oversight because the expectation and recommendation around community engagement um, and how that can improve is a question that both cities are also addressing in different ways, interestingly different ways actually. Um, and then also we had conversations around um, other aspects of public safety like fire, emergency, um, medical response because public safety of course is a broader umbrella than just policing and feeling safe can include more things than just policing. So those conversations started as well. It was a, it, we're in the first phases. Um, there's more to discuss. All right, thank you, President Gable. So what I'd like to do now is um, uh, open this up for, uh, uh, for questions, for commentary, for discussion uh, uh, by uh, all of us uh, on the board. Uh, I see Regent Beeson uh, with his hand raised and um, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll start Regent Beeson uh, with you. Sorry, I'm now unmuted. Okay, uh, thank you. You have the floor. And, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, President Gable and Dr. Alexander and your colleagues who helped prepare the report. You know, I think the, the commissioning of the report was appropriate and timely in assessing where we are with, with the community and UMPD. And President Gable, thanks for moving on this so quickly and contracting with a national consulting uh, organization. Uh, and I really applaud you for getting this conversation started. There is tension around it. Uh, and uh, we're dealing it with in a direct way by having this conversation. I like, frankly, I like the range of recommendations that you've suggested. Uh, you know, you're bringing a national um, best practice and emerging trend perspective, obviously from around the country. And it looks like we'll, we're gonna have a lot of options um, that, uh, that are both uh, can be dealt with immediately and some are gonna take a little bit longer. But, you know, I do, there are elements of the report that I'm troubled with, and I'm going to lay them out to you for, for the record and, frankly, to give credit to UMPD. Um, so, if you would, I want to walk through some of the tables in the report. Mr. Langworth, if you'd put them up on the screen on table one. And I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but I'm going to make a point at the end of my comments. Mr. Langworth, would you put those up, table one? So this is a report around sort of the, the, the peer group. And, you know, I have a real problem with us being compared with most of these universities, although we use them for comparables on cost and on, um, on um, uh, other aspects. They're really apples and oranges when it relates to our metropolitan areas. Our SMSA is, you know, is, is, uh, you know, is, is quite large uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that that's that useful. We could have included some of the other uh, larger cities and are much more urban cities than what we find uh, even in Austin and in, in, uh, in Columbus. On table two, uh, my issue with that is that you're not including any of the Minneapolis police officers 
who also attend to off-campus calls. That's where 85% of our students live. You're acknowledging in the report that we actually co-manage these neighborhoods with Minneapolis, but you're not adding any officers. And you know, you can you can respond to the board afterwards. I may be incorrect with some of these uh, assessments, but uh, that makes us again look like. And on the first table, the issue is we're not in the we're on the edge of the city of Minneapolis. We're not we're not we do not have the same crime rate as the rest of the city necessarily. But there's inferences that one can make. Let's go to table three. Uh, the uh, you point out correctly that that the number of complaints uh, is almost zero. Uh, and this is one of the major disconnects that you heard in the listening sessions and that which we're seeing in the data. Um, I think you're right, people do mistake us for the Minneapolis Police Department. I don't know why we can't have maroon and gold uniforms or something, some visuals that would really separate us out instantly. We go, just scroll down if you would, the use of force is almost zero. And I would challenge you, Dr. Alexander, as to what other police department could post these numbers for their trade area. I think these are very, very low. They certainly don't show uh, trends in, uh, you know, an increase. Thank you. We'll keep moving to table four. Uh, the number of arrests have dropped this year. Um, and I, I don't see patterns of increasing crime on, on table four, table seven, we'll keep moving through. Uh, the number of mental health calls have increased. Now you would think that that would result in more complaints. These are particularly difficult calls that get made, but that hasn't happened even though the number of related calls as, as, uh, is, is increasing. Uh, then the UMPD satisfaction survey, you point out um, we have the highest means since uh, uh, the beginning of the surveys, surveys related to interaction with diverse communities. Now from 2015 uh, to now, these have improved. I, you know, obviously this doesn't match up with the anecdotal side of the report and you point that out. I just, it looks like we sort of skated over this really important table. And then finally, there's some neighborhood crime data um, that, um, we can go down further. That does not prove out a trend in increasing crime. Uh, so my point is that the it's sort of the data that's been chosen, how it's emphasized or not in the report. And that goes to this general disagreement. I've had disagreements with former Regent Lucas and Devine about whether we have we are in a high crime area and whether it's increasing or not. And I don't think this report helps us answer that question. And why that's important is that it, 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 it leads to, the answers leads to the perception of those who fear crime and then those who fear the presence of force who, and who feel that uh, in a higher crime environment, police are gonna be more aggressive or are being more aggressive. So, I, you know, we're sort of swirling around and I get these circular arguments with the former regents about this and I'm a data person and you know they're using anecdotal evidence largely I would say they can we can disagree about that but uh, I you know so I mean I do understand the anecdotal side the listening session I felt listened to by you and I think others have felt listened to and that in and of itself is huge and the fact that we have these disconnects is the problem and I think you know we can't we can't um, disregard those um, but, you know, you said at the end of the report, Dr. Alexander, you said we have an outstanding department. I didn't see that in the report stated like you just said it. Maybe it was in there. But I do feel like we have it. But at the same time, they're not mutually exclusive, uh, that we, we have so much work to do. Uh, and whether it's misplaced anger against Minneapolis or, or, it's, or it's really suspicion of our own police force, we don't know. But we have work to do. You've laid out some roadmaps, and I want to thank you for uh, doing, you've done a good service, and we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Regent Beeson, for those comments and for, you know, presenting, you know, that data. Uh, Dr. Alexander or, or President Gable or both, you know, this issue of sort of the disconnect between, you know, what uh, the numbers say 
but versus the anecdotes and the stories that we hear. Do either one of you want to comment on that, I think, very important point raised by Regent Beeson? Um, I'll start, Mr. Chair, and then I'll defer to Dr. Alexander if he would like to add to it. Um, it's an, I mean, there's, the, you know, as, as the Regent says, the data speaks for itself. And I think that that's the reason why this is so utterly difficult is because, um, as Dr. Alexander says, these two completely opposing views can both be true at the same time, because a lot of what we're trying to resolve here is around um, a perception that um, emerges as a result of very different points of view and perspectives. And so UMPD can be doing good work based on the data and people can still be feeling unsafe. That can coexist. And so what we're trying to do is find a set of um, evolutions, initiatives, um, and engagements that help resolve that undeniable tension. Maybe not to a perfection, but to a space where people feel safe in every way we would define that. So I don't know, Dr. Alexander, if you want to add to that, but that's how I take it. Yes, thank you very much. And I don't want to unpack, I want to unpack some of this uh, Regent Beeson uh, spoke to uh, just a moment ago. I think it's important that to, and, and as you can see from the report itself, uh, and I agree with uh, uh, Regent Beeson on the number of his comments that he made, uh, particularly as it relates to these charts. But of course, these were charts uh, that were requested and that were given to me by your director of uh, Clary Compliance uh, there on your campus. So that's the data that we utilize here. And I, like yourself, uh, Regent Beeson, I think it would be to the interest of the university to make a better comparisons with other cities. I think that is certainly something that can be looked into uh, as you all, if you all decide to go forward uh, on these recommendations. And as it also relates to the data you see here as relates to use of force, uh, for a college campus uh, in and around that campus, yes, those are very significantly low numbers uh, when you think about it. And that is an indication uh, uh, that force is not being used on campus, uh, but it could be an indication and I think we have to challenge ourselves uh, to ask the questions too, uh, is, this ac you know, is this data totally accurate? Are, or is it something else that may be going on that we're not aware of? Uh, but I did not challenge uh, uh, that data. I believe it to be true, but the disconnect is very clear here. You have a low use of force. Uh, you have uh, a police department there that has a, satisfa a satisfaction sh survey that show that they do quality work and you're right, it does not add up. But let me say this to you uh, with some sense of, of, of comfort based on my own experience and based on the experience of others. We have seen this scenario before and we're well aware that police departments such as yours, who I think is doing an outstanding job considering the fact if we also look at the charts they also should have more personnel as it relates to the population on that campus. But here again, I think they do a great job. I don't think it was necessary for me to spell it out that they're doing an outstanding job. It is pretty much clearly written there based on a number of things that were stated and people will internalize very, very, very differently. But I think the challenge here is how do we, the great, the good work that your department is doing, why is it not being perceived by a segment of your community there on that campus as meeting uh, a goal that many, many police departments can't meet? And so that, that truly becomes the ultimate challenge. Now, let's just think for a moment where we are in American policing today across this country and your department is seen as a police department of all the 18,000 police departments across this country. And all of them struggle with the same issue. 
I can tell you haven't been achieved twice in my career. The challenges that are associated with doing great work, but still feeling as if the work is not being achieved because somewhere along the way, there's this misalignment. George Floyd certainly set a, uh, 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 set a tone or, 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 or created an environment, not just George Floyd, but even before George Floyd, but certainly George Floyd was that tipping point in this country that pushed us all back on our heels to come to recognize that we need to look at and see what it is that we can do different around police reform in this country. Because we do know unquestionably and undeniably that there are that there are situations, there are events that happen that cause a great deal of cause and concern for all of us. And it happened right there in your city where you sit in the epicenter of George Floyd. Your distance being on the edge of the city or right in the middle of the city does not matter. It impacts your university, it impacts your community, in this state, in this country, and it has impacts across around the globe. So I think the challenge is for here, and this is just my thought, that I uh, present to the president and to the board, uh, the board of regents, is that my thought is here, I think we have opportunities that exist in these recommendations to focus on that will hopefully help align some of these perceptions of difference. Because people have different experiences under different circumstances. And I may have the best police department in the world but also have people who live in my community as you do around your university community that comes there from different places who have had different experiences with police, who many may come from a police state, depending on the part of the world that they come from, or their police was governed by military, or those that may have come from the South side of Chicago and had a very different experience there as it relates to police. So people come already having their own experience, their own fears, their own doubts. And then there are those who have had great relationships with police all of their lives. So whatever happens, whatever occurs, whatever becomes pronounced, whatever gets on the news, whatever get played over into the images our mind, and it creates this trauma that we all experience, then it just makes the challenging for good police departments and for outstanding police departments to maintain the level of credibility that it seeks to do. I think there are some incredible opportunities here for the university uh, to move forward around reimagining, reforming. I applaud the president for the idea that when she put together this MSAFE implementation team the following day when she received my report, because it's that type of initiative, and I think it's that type of spirit for us to be, all of us, to be able to challenge ourselves. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all want safe communities, and people want to feel like they're part of a larger America. And there's a statement I never forget that President Obama made, and it stated, when any part of American family does not feel like it is being treated fairly, it is a problem for all of us. And that's on the front cover of your report. That's the spirit in which to work with that we attempt to do, to bridge and realign organizations along with the peak communities in which they serve, because police is a very difficult job. It's a very challenging job. And you have a chief there that the recommendations that he made, I made sure were put into this report. And I assured him of that, the same as I did with many of your faculty and staff, that their stories would find their way into this report because they all want the same thing. You have a chief who wanted to provide the very best, the very best public safety that he can for his campus. And he indicated he needs more personnel. He needs more technology and he does. And I support that. And that's clearly outlined here in this report. report. Because they do do a yeoman's, they do an incredible yeoman's job with the personnel that they have, even having to taking on the ethical responsibility of answering calls that may be three or four blocks off your campus. It puts you at incredible risk on a lot of different levels, but they try to manage the both. The city of Minneapolis being short 200 officers is quite frankly not your problem. 
but it creates a problem for you because it means that those that are sworn officers, when that call for service go out where you have shots fired, there is a propensity to respond because ethically and the police officers, as they told me and I share with you, they feel there's something that they have to do. And that comes with being a police officer. It comes with the bravery that you sign up for. But we have to make sure that your campus have adequate support personnel to patrol its grounds and to patrol the areas that are extended under your Clary Act, however y'all define them, define that, those grounds, but to be able to provide the protection that people want because a number of your robberies on your campus are of concern as you read in the report. But a lot of these things quite frankly can be mitigated if we begin to step back, to get some of these recommendations, because if we're going to, if you're going to add technology, if you're going to add body cameras, if you're going to add personnel, then with that also have to come a strategy in which your chief is going to be asked to reduce crime. It has to be a strategy in place, but you also have to be willing and hopefully are able to give him the necessary tools that he need to carry out that mission because it is an incredible mission. So I will stop right there. All right, thank you, Dr. Alexander. I'm gonna move on now. We've got a number of hands raised and I'm gonna to try to start to move through these. Um, uh, and Mr. Uh, Regent Swig, I'm over to you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I'll try to uh, be quick because I know there's other, uh, others that want to speak uh, as well. and. Uh, Dr. Alexander, thank you for your work. Uh, thank you, especially for your balance. Uh, I'm striving and working hard myself to challenge myself to be more balanced in this issue, to challenge myself to be more open and listening. Uh, as we all enter into uh, questions of public safety with certain ideas, experiences, values, uh, biases, whatever it might be. So I struggle with it myself and, and you are helping me, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander, uh, through this. Um, I have said before, in my 40 years of public service, I feel that public safety is the number one goal in a free society. Uh, before any other uh, uh, value, any other program, anything else we do in this country, uh, public safety is number one, because without it, you have nothing, and uh, people need to feel safe. Uh, and I also imagine that in the questions and comments we make, uh, our feelings and our thoughts kind of show through in the questions. Uh, so I'll be very quick. I'm first gonna make just one comment uh, and uh, Regent Beeson has already alluded to this, to the comment. Uh, 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 Regent Beeson, uh, I think it was, I, I forget which of the tables it was, but uh, talked about the uh, complaints against our UMDPD department as being extremely small, extremely low number of complaints. Uh, um, and. And, and I want to highlight that as a, a, a positive of our department and, and even say further that just because there's a complaint against the department, that does not mean that the complaint in itself is justified as, as we've just recently seen at, at the university. Uh, my question, uh, besides the comment, uh, my question gets to... Uh, uh, and Dr. Alexander, I'm sorry, I don't have your report in front of me because I'm at a place I can only use my iPad and not my computer as well. But in one of the pages you talked about, I think the militarization or there was comment about militarization of the uh, UMPD department. And uh, I've been on the campus many, many, many years and many, many, many times. I I've never seen anything that gets close to a military style uh, vehicle or a military style weapon. Uh, and, and I, I, I just, I'm just trying to remember what the words were that were used, but we certainly have a department that isn't even close, I don't think, to uh, militarization of, uh, of, of use of uh, uh, weaponry or vehicles or anything of that nature. And can you refer to that? Uh, you remember that in your report? I, I don't have it in front of me, and I can't even tell you the page, but if you would refer to that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So I, yeah. So 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 and, let and, me and and if I can just um if I can just jump in, thank you, Regent Swigum, for that question. And Dr. Alexander, I, I want to be able to get to a, a, a long list of questions. So I just want to ask you to be you know recognizing the complexity of this. If you be as concise as you can, so that we can get to everybody. Yes, sir. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Regent Swiggum. Uh, in regards to the militarization, I'm glad that you brought that up because oftentimes it's a matter of perception. So as you well know, in recent months, you've had uh, major civil unrest and you had protests in your community. And you've had a university community there uh, being common everyday lay people who from their observation, they consider assault rifles, they may consider uh, a riot gear, they may consider police vests uh, as being um, militarized equipment. And certainly when we see the images of events that just not have occurred in your city, but across the country, it brings people to mind, are our police becoming more militarized? Here is one of the biggest challenges, and here's one thing I indicated in this report, uh, Regent Swigum, I think is gonna be very important. You're absolutely right. When during my visit on that campus and I saw patrol cars, I saw police officers, no, they did not look like a military operation whatsoever. But we know that in the event that there's going to be protests, uh, whether it's downtown, whether it's out on I-94, wherever the case may happen to be, you're going to see police from your state and your city, and maybe even your own police, who will come equipped in riot gear for protection should something go bad. And for us, for many, that may be considered militarized. When people see long rifles, they may consider that to be militarized. One thing that I have always uh, attempted to practice and be aware of, even my time as chief, is that I teach and uh, uh, educate the community as to the equipment that we have in our possession. If we go back to August 9th, 2014, just following Michael Brown, and we remember those civil unrest that took place in Ferguson, we saw what many people, common lay people, were referred to as a tank. And, on, and we saw people on top of those tanks with long rifles pointed down range at American citizens who were peacefully protesting. And we saw some of that even as recent as this past summer. So in the minds, the perceptions of many people is that the police are becoming militarized. How do we demilitarize? One thing that I would strongly suggest is I'm gonna close here, is that police departments, your police departments and other have an opportunity to sit with that community there on that campus and explain the importance of why this equipment is important, under what circumstances, the training that goes along with it and the policies that go along with it. And I indicated that in the report because I think that that would be a great opportunity to be able to help people understand when they say demilitarization, what does it mean? But we have to be able to train, we have to be able to educate people in terms of this equipment that we utilize, because we do not know, you do not know. And God forbid that there's ever an incident on your campus where police have to respond to rescue people out of a building because of a horrible situation. They need to have the appropriate equipment. But when is that equipment necessary? When should it be introduced? What is the policy that goes along with it? And how much training comes with it? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Alexander. Uh, Re uh, Regent Strickland, does that get to it? Oh, very fine, Mr. Chairman. Let's move on. Okay, thank you. Regent Anderson. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in this report, and I've been digesting it, and there's, there's going to have to be a lot come together between the data and the perception. My question is actually very brief, and it, it uh, I've been looking at the four recommendations that President Gable's putting into uh, place right now. And my question is simply, I don't understand the Rave Guardian campus safety app that we're going to be providing to students and staff. Can somebody tell me how that, uh, how that works or how it protects, where's the safety feature in it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Anderson. I, I bet you're not the only person uh, with that question. I'm going to toss that to President Gable, either for her to answer or to uh, 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 direct traffic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regent Anderson, RAVE is one example. There are competitors and we would go through the bid to ultimately select, but some people are very familiar with RAVE, so we refer to it by the brand name. It is an app that you put on your phone that essentially is a virtual escort. So if you're walking to your car at night or walking across campus, 
and you're alone and you're uncomfortable, you can use the app and, and you set your phone in a certain way so that it calls 911 very quickly. Um, you don't have to stop, pull out your phone, dial 911. The different apps do that in different ways. Some you hold your phone in a certain button. It's just a, it's a virtual escort. Thank you, thank you. I, I think it's a good idea, yep. Thanks okay. Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Alexander, I, I think Regent Anderson thought he was being invited to a rave. Um, that is something entirely different, <laughs> uh, Tom. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the report and just have a, a few thoughts and comments. Um, first, going to you know piggyback off of um, Regent Beeson's comments, um, specifically to the to the chart tonight, I believe we saw a similar chart in our last presentation, um, I think maybe December, um, similar to this topic. And, you know, I, I think if you compare Minneapolis to, to you know, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, yeah, this place is gonna look pretty unsafe. So definitely, I think we need to be more selective um, with the, the peer comparisons um, because a lot of these can, I mean, campuses usually aren't, in, in, in urban centers the way we are. They're usually, you know, a lot of these campuses, I've been to all of them, but I don't think a lot of them are in cities um, like ours. Um, I think I think we're all in agreement on, on the need for body cams. Um, the the blue light recommendation, I um, I mean, in, in the nature of, of everyone with their phones and whatnot, I mean, I don't know how effective those will be and what are the chances you're by one in the instance of a crime, but it's a recommendation. I think the, the conversation about off campus and on campus isn't even isn't even um, limited to this topic, right? Um, and we in the report, there's a quote, I think it's from Chief Clark, that the university needs to be clear and, and give him direction on, on what to do where, but that's a challenge that the university faces and everything, unlike any other entity, if a, if a, if a university student something happens to them, good or bad, they're always associated with the university. You know, that's what the paper will say. U of M student does this, U of M student that. And, and that, that responsibility that a university is given for um, an undergraduate student usually is, is unlike employers don't have that, you know, high schools don't have that. And, and I think it's, it's just an extension of that. But I do like Regent Beeson's point that off campus isn't also just only patrolled by um, UMPD. On that last conversation about um, military equipment, I mean, I think I'm hearing it's technically incorrect, and, and I don't know that that's what matters, right? I mean, I and I'm assuming others don't know that don't know what an assault rifle versus a long rifle is, but what they're telling you is, I feel uncomfortable seeing it, right? And you're right that you're not going to walk down University Avenue and probably see one, but we have seen it in. In, you know, a student protest and this and that. And I think people are saying like, I, I don't care what kind it is, that doesn't help me feel safer. And that's that's the role of, of you know, our public safety department and, and UMPD. So I, I would, I would, um, I would caution being, you know, dismissive of that um, as, you know, it was reiterated by, it, it, it sounds like it came up a lot in your sessions and uh, the, the emails I've, that we got mostly in the summer aren't just from students, it's faculty um, mm -hmm. a, as well. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to, for whatever reason, I feel that sometimes there's certain positions that are expected of students and that almost empowers people to dismiss them. Like, oh, of course the students think that or are gonna say that, right? And it shouldn't be that way, but I think sometimes that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. The students like, we should lower tuition. It's like, Duh, of course that's what they're supposed to think. I don't know if we always give it enough credence um, so the fact that we're hearing it from faculty and staff as well, um, I hope that that doesn't go unnoticed, regardless of what the technical aspects of it is and is not. Um, again, to a couple of those tables that, uh, you know, Regent Beeson walked us through, um, the mental health one, I think it, under table seven, it says that that one officer has received additional training on how to manage and de-escalate mental health calls. Um, and and I, I think one isn't enough and you know the one thought is okay let's have additional training for the remainder but i i always encourage 
I encourage us to reconsider. Um, you know, a lot of what a lot of people are saying is it should police be the ones responding to this in the first place, right? I mean, the the different degrees that folks who handle mental mental health go through require four years, <laughs> and we give them at this school. Um, giving training that, and I don't know how long it is, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a couple hours. Um, that's not the same. And I think, I, I think we're asking, we at the university, but also just we, you know, as a country and whatnot, are asking um, police to, to handle things they, they just shouldn't. They just, should, they're, they're not the ones trained for. And it's, it's great to see that there's additional training coming through. Um, the, lastly, I'm going to speak to the, you know, the reports and accountability. But before that, table eight was about sexual assault. And this one really stuck out to me. Two reports in 2018, 13 in 2019, and seven in 2020. Those aren't, that's not accurate, right? And not because the data is wrong, but because we know, we've seen the other data on uh, one in, you know, one in whatever women on a college campus, this, that. Um, we've heard the anecdotal stories. Um, it's pretty well known that 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 victims of sexual assault, um, victim, victims of sexual assault, do not see, do not feel comfortable reporting to the police sometimes, or feel that if they do, nothing's going to happen to it, or right. and they're like, what's the point, right? And I really don't want us to gloss over this, um, because we know the numbers are way higher than this. Um, we, we know the numbers are higher than this, and I bet if we, I bet if we if we check with with uh, the university office, Title IX, that's receiving these, they're going to have higher numbers, right? So this is not where uh, survivors and victims feel comfortable going. And and I don't I don't have a prescription for that. I I, I don't have a I, there's not much I'm saying there, but I don't think it's something worth glossing over. And I think what it tells us is that what's reported isn't necessarily what happened, right? It isn't always isn't always right. And that that segues into you know table three, which which was about public internal affairs complaints. And I will agree that those are low numbers. Um, but I don't know that, I don't know that people want to report on the police to the police. Um, and I don't know what that mechanism should look like. And I know it's been an ongoing discussion in the student uh, and faculties, the university Senate and, and talking about what kind of oversight um, and governance mechanisms we can have in the, in the report, Dr. Alexander says, the, re the reality is that UMPD has undergone all those trainings and more. The challenge will be to incorporate accountability and oversight. Um, and I think that's where we have to focus um, the oversight uh, beforehand and the accountability thereafter. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know what, com what number of complaints there should have been or what happened. And I'm not gonna insinuate one way or the other, but I can assume that, that, you know, so we talked a lot about the, the disconnect between the anecdotal and, and the numbers. And one of the reasons that was given is that people are confusing UMPD with uh, MPD. And I imagine there's probably some of that, but that can't account for all of it, right? You know, if, if you see something from afar, you might be able to, to confuse it. But students, faculty, and staff that actually interact with the officers they can read. They're literate. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to give them a little more credit than that to be able to read a badge, to, to read the car. So if they're from afar, fine. But clearly, some of these incidents are not are not um, are not the confusion um, and whatever. So so I think um, accountability and oversight are 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 the big ones. And I think you know, accountability is so huge because that's I think that's what and maybe this part of the comment isn't just limited to UM, uh, UMPD, maybe just more on, on police. It's the, um, you know, when we see things happen across the country, there's the first reaction, and then there's the reaction after the verdict. <laughs> you know, people, people want accountability, right? That's, that's why the governor um, is, just said he's going to deploy the National Guard ahead of the, uh, the Derek Chauvin trial, because we know how people react to a lack of accountability. So I think um, I think we need to focus on those two parts: um, oversight and and therefore the and then the accountability, and then and then reimagine or just realign where we direct mental health and sexual assault cases. 
I'm not denying that UMPD has worked to be better responsive to them. I, I know they have, we have the evidence here, but maybe that's not enough and they probably shouldn't be asked to handle this stuff um, in the first place. And we have the resources across the university. And I know there's some of that already happening, um, but those are some of my initial reactions. So, so I think, I would say, I, th I think the, the steps that the president outlined are appropriate starts as well. We can discuss some of the other things here. And, you know, this report isn't the end. Now we go back to the larger campus. I know the Senate, uh, some of the Senate leadership was, was um, advocating to hold off on their action until this came through so they could consider this. So this obviously isn't the end point. This is perhaps a midpoint. Um, I know we've discussed, um, or it's been discussed and suggested that um, we need to increase the, the force. Um, I, I would... I would not support that at the moment because we have a whole lot of we have a whole lot of recommendations here, um, and I think we need to work through those. And and um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Alexander, and thank you. Thank Mr. you, Regent to Kenyanya, for for those um, very good points. And in, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue to just kind of click through here, um, and I'm showing next uh, Regent Her. Mr. Chair, apologize. I thought uh, Regent Chu was ahead of me. But um, first of all, um, Dr. Cedric Alexander, I want to thank you for your report. It's very, very comprehensive. It, in reading it, it actually gave me more than I thought I would get out of it. And so I, I, I thank you and I appreciate for your thoroughness um, in, in, in all of this. And I really do like your recommendations um, and where they're going to, because I do long for, and I work uh, really hard towards a violence-free world. Um, and I, I believe we will get there um, if we build trust, engagement, and communication. Uh, and those are, are, those are very, very key uh, <clears throat> items. And I see that in, in your report, um, in, in your, in your um, recommendations. So, I love the part um, in which you, um, and some of the steps that President Gable is, is taking, but I, I love your point in, 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 in engaging the community in the police training so that they know what the police is doing. I think that there's a huge disconnect between what community expects and what police are doing. Um, so the more that we can communicate with each other and know what we're doing, um, then we can balance public safety versus a sense of safety. My question then regards to uh, really trying to get the community involved and engaged is I've heard from uh, students and also from the community too around uh, community voices in, in adjudication. Um, and I think that that's the second uh, point of your, your priority is, is even in uh, George Floyd, I, I was really touched by how the community was very, very uh, vested in the uh, judicial system in that they wanted justice and they wanted to use the judicial system to get them that justice. And so uh, did, students probably brought up the idea of um, student voices um, in, in this whole process. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Regent Hur, the, the, that question goes to uh, Dr. Alexander. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Alexander, if you would uh, take a take a shot at that? Yes, I yes I will, and and thank you, Regent Hurd. I'll try to answer that as quickly as I can. Uh, nothing builds relationships greater and faster between police and any community than transparency. Nothing. When people understand what their police police department is doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, it creates an openness in which people feel that they're not over their public safety is not being provided by some clandestine operation. That has been the culture of policing, particularly during my time. I'm a baby boomer, but I'm also a very recent chief over the last few years. But I will say this, one thing that I have learned, uh, not just from the 21st Century Task Force report, but from my own experience, is that the more open that I am about what we do inside our organization, the more people are drawn into it, the more people share into the ideals around public safety 
and they also have a better idea as to how they too are responsible for their own public safety. Uh, when policing stood up in London under Sir Robert Peel, who was the Home Secretary during that time, he made it very clear in the very beginning is that police are the community and the community is the police. They are two of the same. They are two of the same. And when they work collaboratively together, it reduces anxiety, it builds trust, it allow for two-way communications. And what people are saying today, Regent Her, is that they want to have input into their public safety and they should. Who, would, who knows better about what their community needs than the people who live in it every day? And there should be a place for them to have a voice. And it also is a place for police to share its experience uh, with that public safety as well. But it's not a one-way street. We're moving away from conventional law enforcement and public safety. Some of us can wrap our arms around us and some of us cannot. And those who cannot, quite frankly, you hear about them every day leaving the profession. And what I say to them is bye. Because what the American people want today, young and old, black and white, regardless of where you are, people want to feel that they have input into their public safety. They want it to be open. They want it to be transparent. They want it to be honest. They want it to be balanced. So if you want to build a relationship there with your university community. People who made statements in this report who weren't just having a bad day, but people who told stories based on their affect. And I could see it, I'm a clinical psychologist. I know affect when I see it. And I know how people report it. And I know when people have been traumatized and we know they've been traumatized yet. So there's a lot of work for all of us to do. This is not an indictment on anyone. This is a process of opportunity in which we all can do something better together. And people on your university campus, your distinguished faculty, your staff, and your brilliant students who come from across the country and around the globe are saying to you, we want that transparency. We want to know more about our police department because if they knew the difference between a M4 rifle and an AR-15, which is basically the same, they sit on the same framework, but without getting into the technicalities of it, they don't know. They don't know, most people don't know that. They don't know that the vest that police officers wear now where you see loaded equipment on them was designed to take belts off of their waist that was creating medical problems from them as they get older. That is science. That is not anecdotal. That is based on science. But to that vest that is, people see all this equipment, to them, they don't understand it. It looked militarized. So we have to take an opportunity to share with people what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. Good example and I'll end here. Chief Adirondo over at Minneapolis, as of yesterday, him and his mayor, have introduced a new re recruitment process and they are looking for those that got social work backgrounds, those who have background in social science, those who have experience maybe around understanding, better understanding people that they may engage that have mental health issues. And to Regent Kenyatta's point, yes, we need to train people who can work specifically with that population, whether they be police or civilians, but we need, to give, we need to give great attention to that because in this country right now, every day in America, we're still sending police out to be mental health counselors and to engage people who are in the crisis of their life and who end up something negatively going wrong. And you just saw that recently in the city in which I was deputy mayor and police chief at one time, Rochester, New York, a nine-year-old girl gets sprayed in the face because she is having an emotional moment by police. That impacts police across this country. And no matter how great a job your police department may be doing, yes, people can read Rochester Police, University of Minnesota uh, Police Department, but to the general public, police is police. And that's what we have to deal with. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Alexander. I'm gonna move on now to Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, um, for the great report and your comments today. Um, I wanna echo my colleagues' comments. I think they're all excellent. I think this is a great discussion. And um, I think transparency and accountability are very important for us um, in, in this particular area. And uh, regarding the body cams, I'm glad to hear that you recommend it. I'm glad to hear that we're moving forward with that. I, I think it's um, obviously something that uh, is missing from um, the equipment that we issue our officers. And I think we also have to be uh, considerate of the fact that uh, we have to be able to provide uh, our officers with um, the uh, tools to do their work and they have to be, they have to feel safe as well. Otherwise they wouldn't work for us. Um, regarding uh, the demilitarization comment, um, when I joined the board in 2015, that was something that was on the agenda. I think we took care of that. I think it was uh, with the previous chief, um, but we were at that time receiving surplus military equipment from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And I think for some reason there was a federal program that made that equipment available to us and we were taking it, um, but I think that's all gone now. So I think that has been dealt with whether or not an AR-15 is considered a military weapon, you know, that's debatable, I think. But um, I, I think that I think that most of that has been done. Um, also, I'm aware of uh, a case where UMPD and MPD teamed up and they caught a serial rapist who had been uh, at work for four or five years uh, on our campus and around our campus um, during, uh, during the time that I was on the board. And I, before I joined the board, I had um, uh, worked with MPD and, and UMPD uh, in other areas uh, related to sexual assault and, and those types of things. So I was very concerned with uh, some of those things uh, when I joined the board. Um, now, uh, after having been on the board for six years, I am very thankful that we have not had an incident like the one that you described, which is uh, I think more of an active shooter type um, situation. So my question to you is, what is the right way for us to be, I mean, uh, prepared in terms of uh, training, in terms of tools, uh, that type of thing? Uh, I think there are some people who uh, would believe that the best thing for us to do is uh, to not be able to deal with the situation ourselves and to have to call for backup and to have someone else arrive uh, on the scene with the necessarily necessary tools and equipment. Um, and, you know, I, I think back to uh, when we hosted the Super Bowl here, days before the Super Bowl, we had, uh, and you may or may not be aware of this, but we had a situation where one of our hotels on campus, which is um, on university property, but the hotel is not owned by us. Uh, there was a man who barricaded himself into that hotel and we shut down uh the, he was on the back side of the hotel, which faced our rec center, and we ended up having to shut down our rec center for several days. So I, I think that uh, the answer that I'm looking for is the answer to that question, which is what do we need to have um, in-house and what do we need to um, have um, at our disposal, uh, either through Minneapolis or St. Paul, in order to deal with this? And I'm, I'm going to, Dr. Alexander, ask you, with great respect, Regent Shu, I'm really worried about time now. And if we could hold the answer to that so that I can get through the other uh, questions, and then we'll see if we can find a way to get it answered. Uh, apologies, but I really want to keep us moving here. I'm going to turn now to uh, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll, I, um, my question was related to a department's expectation and the value in um, a, the institution, in this case, the university, as opposed to a, a municipality um, standing up on behalf of a department. Um, you know, in the, in the event you have a narrative that comes forward that doesn't appear to be supported by the objective facts related to that incident, uh, to an incident, 
to what extent you know it's important for uh, the university as opposed to just the department to step forward um, on that matter, whether it's an accountability, whether it's a clarification um, in the interest of, of not only uh, defending the perception of the department, but also in the, um, the satisfaction and, and, and confidence of the, of the people that are part of your police force uh, in knowing that they would receive that kind of backing. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not gonna request an answer to that right now, but that was one of the things that was on my mind in this, in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th th thank you, thank you, Regent Rocha. I appreciate your patience and I am absolutely certain <clears throat> Uh, that President Gable and, and her folks are are getting every single one of these questions and we're going to want to come back. And so thank you for getting that in the record. And I know you'll get a response. Uh, last uh, is Regent Mayron. Thank you. And I, I think my question is probably uh, a tag along to Regent Shoes. And that is I'm looking uh, at what hopefully will become the solution down the road, Dr. Alexander. And I'm wondering if there are any cities or colleges, uh, campuses, that, uh, police departments that you can point to currently that have, in your view, successfully addressed this tension that you so uh, describe in your report in great detail in terms of perceptions about safety uh, and uh, safety, uh, addressing safety on the one hand and addressing the fear of the police on the other hand. Are there, are there communities out there that have successfully addressed it? And if so, what is it that they have done that you might consider a best practice that we could begin to look at here? And maybe that's embedded in your recommendations, but I'm looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. Are there certain communities or colleges out there that you think have successfully addressed this tension? Dr. Alexander, if you could maybe just briefly give us a few strong benchmarks that we could look at and study as we go forward uh, in this important project. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Regent Mayron. Let me respond to you like this, is that everyone is seeking that answer that you're referring to. Nobody's doing it perfectly, perfectly correct. Everybody is taking every opportunity that they can based on recommendations from their own studies and their own communities by doing their own investigations in some places and in other places having questioning sessions such as what we've had here. The undertaking right now of attempting to help police to bridge those relationships across this country, particularly in communities of color, is a challenge. And every time we have a negative incident occur somewhere in this country, it sets us back significantly, significantly. So it's always one step forward, 20 steps back. But let me say this, one of the most important things that can be done here is that we continue to challenge ourselves, is that we find ways to make our police departments open. We find ways to continue to build those relationships because right now at this very moment, and you experienced that in Minneapolis just a few weeks ago. A bad guy inside a car shot from inside the car outside at police. Police returned fire, which is in Minneapolis police got that video out right away, the same way that you all did a few nights ago in an incident that you had, which certainly what did not measure to that. But the point that I'm making in this, both of those events and one in clearly where the police use what appeared to be, from what we know, appropriate force. Once they were fired upon, they returned fire. But you still had protests in your community. You still had protests. We're at a place right now where robbers can run outside of a bank with, the, with guns and bags of money in their hand and shoot that the police. Police can shoot back and people will still scrutinize police in this country. Why is that? Because legitimacy is at play. Trust is at play. That's the problem. We got to regain that trust. Because to speak very honestly and candidly, when I reviewed the video and your, you know, your students there the other night, and what occurred in the statements that were wrongly made against those officers who were pleasant and professional in an interaction that didn't last 40 seconds, it is unfortunate, but we got to look at that a little bit deeper. And part of the issue is here. 
What kind of environment are we sitting in across this country where police still can do it very much right, but they still are scrutinized? We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of trust building to do, but we must understand and accept the fact that when something goes awry in the community, regardless of wherever it is, and it becomes, and it receives national attention, it sets all of us back. Building relationships and building those bridges is ongoing. I, you know, if I would like to request, and I don't know if it's appropriate to do so, but I will take the risk here. Uh, Chairman Powell, I would add uh, you and President Gable, I would be more than glad to circle back around and answer some of these questions I, were not, I was not able to get to uh, with a smaller group, because I think it's important, even though my contract is ended, for me, it is just hugely important to be able to hear those questions and to be able to respond to them in some way that may be helpful to your institution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for um, those closing comments. I'm sure there would be interest, uh, great interest in doing that. Apologize, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, as ever in a meeting like this, we've got to, we've got to sort of keep, keep it moving. So thank you for that offer. I'm sure there'll be interest in that. Uh, the president will follow up. I want to thank you for very much for um, your report, which not only was it very comprehensive, but as you said, um, everybody got a voice. I think that's critically important. Everybody was heard. So we thank you for that. Um, President Gable, before we conclude, uh, move on. Do you have any uh, concluding comments? Uh, no, just uh, very briefly to say thank you to everybody. I want to particularly thank Megan Sweet in my office, who was Dr. Alexander's liaison for all of the work and all of those meetings. She managed that entire process. Um, think and also say that as we can see from this discussion that this is not a up and down conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. This is just the beginning. And I look forward to the additional feedback loops that we will absolutely bring forward for your review. All right. Thank you very much, President Gable. And thank you, fellow regents, for a very, very, very thoughtful and probing conversation. Thank you so much. We're going to turn now to uh, the report of the, of the uh, committee's We'll begin with a report of the Audit and Compliance Committee. And Regent Rocha, if you would please share your report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Audit and Compliance Committee did not consider any action items this month. The committee had several important discussion items I'll highlight briefly. Spent the first half of our meeting focused on our external audit activities with the engagement team from Deloitte. First, they provided their final summary of the fiscal year 2020 audit work. We were pleased to again receive no material findings and issued clean audits. Then the team outlined their plan for activities for fiscal year 2021. Chief Compliance Officer Boyd Coomer joined the committee for a discussion on the university's ethics program. The committee last discussed the ethics program in 2018, and Mr. Coomer explained the work that has been done since then, as well as next steps in the implementation of the program. In our final item, Chief Auditor Klatt provided the committee with a brief internal audit update, reporting that 23% of recommendations rated as essential were implemented, significantly lower than the expected rate of 40%. Although the implement implementation rate was lower than expected, she assured the committee that the internal audit team feels the departments are making satisfactory progress under the current circumstances. The committee will continue to monitor the implementation rate of audit findings to ensure adequate progress is being made. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha, for that report. Uh, Regent Beeson, we'll turn to you now for your report on behalf of the Litigation Review Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Litigation Review Committee um, met and on, uh, met, and um, we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss three matters subject to attorney-client privilege. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Beeson. We'll, uh, we'll now move on to the report of the Finance and Operations Committee. And there were multiple items voted on in the committee. And just to streamline things, we're going to take all the unanimous recommendations of the committee as one motion. So in other words, items that were recommended unanimously will be taken together in one vote, unless any member of the board would like to separate any of these items from the motion, which follows our normal practice for consent. Uh, Regent McMillan, will you introduce those items for the board's consideration, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Powell. The report of the Finance and Operations Committee includes three items that were unanimously recommended by the committee for approval by the board. These include the resolution related to the system-wide campus master planning principles, 
the committee separated out the Google purchase and authorization to execute contracts consistent with the materials in the docket and the remaining items in the revised consent report, which included or include Central Reserve's general contingency, purchase of goods and services, $1 million and over, and the appointment and employment agreement for the Vice President for Student Affairs and the Dean of Students. There were no other items voted on by the committee this month, Chair Powell, and I move approval of the committee report. And all three of those resolutions, uh, Chair McMillan, were, um, were approved unanimously. Yes. Okay, thank you. So before I call for uh, the vote by the full board, is there any regents who would like to separate an item uh, recommended by uh, the committee? Uh, Mr. Steves, do you, is any hands up? Chair Powell, I'm not seeing any hands. All right, very good then. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, move to uh, a vote on those, uh, on those motions. On the finance and, finance and Operations Committee report, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, that motion is approved, thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan, any other uh, committee business that you wanted to report on? No, there's no other business, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All right, thank you very much. Moving to the Mission Fulfillment Committee, uh, Regent Anderson, uh, please will you give us your report? Okay, Chair Powell, the Mission Fulfillment Committee acted on one action item this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes the approval of academic program changes, the conferral of tenure for outside faculty hires, and approval of post-secondary planning, a joint report to the Minnesota legislature, and approval of the museum collection policies. I move approval of the consent report. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments on uh, that motion? Seeing none then, I'll ask Mr. Steves to call the roll. On the report of the Mission Fulfillment Committee, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, that motion uh, is approved. Uh, Regent Anderson, was there any other committee business that you want to report on? No, sir, that concludes my report. All right, thank you. And then uh, finally, Regent Mayron, please share the report of the Governance and Policy Committee. Thank you. The report of the Governance and Policy Committee has two action items on our agenda today. The committee voted unanimous, unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to amendments to the urgent approval authority. I move approval of that resolution. All right. Any questions or comments uh, on that resolution? I don't, I don't see any, so I think Mr. Steves can call the roll. On amendments to the Urgent Approval Authority, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. 
Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rocha? Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum? Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and zero opposed. All right, that motion is approved. But Regent Mayron, other additional committee business. Yes, the committee voted to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, alcoholic beverages on campus. I move adoption of the policy. Thank you. Uh, we previously this morning had a very good discussion uh, of that policy. Are there any other Regent questions or comments? And Mr. Steves, I'll ask you to help me if, if, see if there are any other, any, any hands raised. Chair Paul, I'm not seeing any hands. All right, let's let's uh, let's take the roll then on that resolution. On amendments to the policy on alcoholic beverages on campus, Regent Anderson. No. Regent Anderson votes no. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya? No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Mayron? Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Simonson? No. Regent Simonson votes no. Regent Swigum? Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are seven in favor and five opposed. All right, by a vote of seven to five, that motion is approved. Uh, Regent Mayron, anything else uh, from the Governance and Policy Committee that you would like to report on? No, thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All righty, thank you. All right, let, that concludes our committee reports, brings us to old business. Uh, is there any old business to come before the board? All right, is there any new business to come before the board? All right. Chair Powell, Regent Shu has his hand raised. Oh, Regent Shu. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if uh, we could have a brief discussion about uh, uh, having commencements this, uh, this spring. I have not heard anything about that. And as you know, uh, there are um, student voices asking uh, for commencement planning um, to occur. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I have not talked to the administration about this, but I feel like uh, this is a good time to bring it up. I I think that uh, an outdoor commencement uh, maybe is maybe this is the right time for it. Um, the last one was in 1974 at the state fairgrounds. Um, we, we obviously have a football stadium, which has been used uh, throughout the pandemic, and it might be a, an opportunity to plan for um, a commencement. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Regent Shu. Uh, President Gable, uh, maybe you could, uh, would you outline for us uh, the, the process that you will be going through as you evaluate this, uh, the question that's been raised? Um, yes. Uh Mr. Chairman and Regent Chu, members of the board, as you might imagine, we have received a lot of communication about commencement um, and have started the process of analyzing the options through the Emergency Management Committee. That process is not yet complete. Um, and so we, as much as people would like to know now, and we fully appreciate that, there's a lot changing right now and we would recommend um, a little more review and examination and then bringing forward um, either a memo or recommendations, to, depending on the form that they ultimately take uh, to the board and informing you of the decision as we have with the other pandemic decisions soon, but we're not quite ready. All right. Thank you for the, thank you for the, uh, the question, Regent Shu. And I think it sounds like you're on it, President Gable. And I know that, um, you know, we'll have to move on this in a timely fashion. So thank you. Uh, any other new business? All right. Uh, Thank you all for uh, uh, what? Yeah, Re uh, Regent Kenyanya has his hand up. All right, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a brief question. I 
I raised my hand during the president's report, um, but um, it didn't get to me. So I'll just bring it up now. Uh, President Gable, you mentioned uh, a new position, senior advisor on tribal affairs. Um, I was just wondering how that relates to um, with the position I think we created a little over a year ago that's currently held by, I think, Professor Tad Johnson. Um, if you could just comment on that and um, if they're the same or how they relate to each other. President Gable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Kenyanya, the senior advisor for tribal affairs would report to me. Um, and then Professor Johnson would report to the senior advisor. Professor Johnson's role is as a liaison with the tribes. He does not have oversight over the broader academic mission over the um, land discussions that Mayak has asked us to consider that will eventually work its way to a discussion with the board around scholarships or around special issues as they emerge, several of which we've reported on over time and can fully anticipate that there will be more in the future. This is a bigger role than what Professor Johnson holds um, to represent the depth of the commitment and the breadth and complexity of the work. Thank you, President Gable. Um, and uh, Regent Kenyanya, I apologize for not seeing that your hand was raised during that report. And I'm glad you were able to get that question in. No worries, that answers the question. Thank you, President Gable, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Steves, do we see any other hands raised? There are no additional hands, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks to all for very, very good uh, discussions uh, during our session this morning. And I wish everybody a good afternoon. Uh, this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned.